Um, welcome everyone to uh, Systems Neuroscience and Complexity meeting. Um, it's my absolute pleasure today to have Charlie Wilson uh, from the University of Texas in San Antonio to give us a, a, a speech about the Globus pallidus externus, which is uh, one of the surprisingly more mysterious regions of, of an area that we often think of as sort of really, really well characterized, which is the basal ganglia. Um, so I first met Charlie a few years ago. Um, I was living in San Antonio uh, with my wife and her family. Um, and when you live with your in-laws, you look for absolutely any excuse to get out of the house um, that you can. And um, I looked up Charlie, he had this really great podcast um, called Neuroscientist Talk Shop. And I started listening to a few of the, the uh, podcast um, episodes, really enjoyed some of them. Um, they're really focused on cellular neuroscience, but lots of different perspectives. And so I felt like it was this really great way for me to kind of understand as, as a, a you know, fMRI researcher predominantly, to understand this really different form of exploring what is exactly the same system. So a completely different scale, different kinds of techniques. And I found that really enriching. And so on a whim, I, I, I wrote to Charlie asking him some, some sort of prickly questions about how the globus pal uh, sorry, how the basal ganglia and the thalamus and the cerebellum interact, which has really been a, a major fascination for me for a long time. And rather than ignoring an fMRI researcher and just telling him to flick off, he actually wrote me back a really thoughtful email, lots of new research for me to read. And I'm, I'm quite very happy to say that that led to a number of really, really great interactions. So we would have lunch and really great conversations about how the nervous system is organized at scale, but then how to think about it in these different lenses, right? The systems level versus the, the, the cellular perspective. And so I'm really, really, really glad to have Charlie here today to speak to us about some of this research. Um, I will say uh, that um, if you do have questions about the practical stuff, Charlie's more than happy for you to jump in and ask questions as we go. Um, and then we can also have a quick chat at the end as well if people have anything they'd like to ask. So um, thank you very much, Charlie. Looking forward to hear your talk. Thanks. Thanks, Mac. It was, it's, um, it's great to be here. Never been to Australia before, so it's a real joy. <laughs> and then uh, also I mentioned one of the best podcasts was the one we did with Mac. So I'm going to share my presentation and uh, I hope this looks right to you. So um, what I want to talk about is the, a process that's really important to me and may not uh, be something that you would even have ever thought about. but. Uh, it's the process of going from knowing a lot about individual cells to knowing about a nucleus in the brain that, uh, that is comprised of those cells. So that's a huge step. Studying the cells by themselves is technically pretty easy on the scale of scientific difficulty and uh, certainly doable. And we know a ton about the cells. Over the years, we have learned so much about a lot of different cell types in the basal ganglia. But uh, the next step for us is to know something about the, the nucleus itself and be able to imagine the function of the nucleus at the network in that part of the brain as a thing, as opposed to thinking about the cells as a, as a thing. So this is a picture of the globus pallidus in parasagittal section from a mouse. This I'm kind of outlining it. I hope you can see my pointer. Can yeah, that's showing point? up, Charlie. Yep. Okay, great. So uh, I'm kind of outlining the external globus pallidus segment. The internal segment is down here. This is the striatum. This is the thalamus over here. And this lit up area is nucleus reticularis in the thalamus. And these this is one population, one of two major populations of globus pallidus neurons that have been marked here by uh, genetically and uh, by, by injection of a virus that, had, um, that is expressed in a Cree dependent way. And this particular cell type is uh, expressing Cree in those cells. So this is like one uh, I don't know, maybe 30% of all the cells in the globus pallidus that you see, and these project to the striatum, and you can see their axons there, they project to the nucleus reticularis. The, stri the globus pallidus is in the middle of the basal ganglia. It gets input from practically every part of the basal ganglia, and it sends its axons to almost 
all parts, including places that are not basal ganglias, like nucleus reticularis and the thalamus into the cortex. So uh, I've always thought about neurons as the atoms of meaning. And so uh, this is this wild looking man with a 19th century beard is Warren McCulloch. He is one of the most influential thinkers of the 20th century. Maybe you're completely familiar with him. Uh, I hope so, because he was a fascinating guy. He's the co-founder of the cybernetics movement and the father of artificial neural networks and a hugely important neurophysiological, neurophysiological theorist and experimentalist as well. Anyway, he claimed that by firing each neuron asserts a logical proposition and he viewed the neurons as logical elements. And so he thought that when a neuron fired an action potential, it meant something. Maybe the neuron would be wrong, but that neuron is asserting something about a movement, about some cognitive state, about some sensory stimulus. And largely that view of McCulloch's is the one that has driven cellular neuroscience over the years. And the, um, the biophysical manifestation of, of McCulloch's view is uh, sort of illustrated here in a great cartoon uh, by uh, Eugene Ishikevitz in his fantastic book, Dynamical Systems in Neuroscience, which I super strongly recommend. If you haven't ever read it, you'd love it. It's not just because it's such a great book scientifically, but also it's full of these great cartoons written, drawn by Eugene and, and usually starring Eugene. So here's Eugene dressed in his characteristic uh, Russian sailor's shirt. And he is uh, doing a little parody of a popular uh, television show from the early 2000s in which he is being the boss and he's leaning over the desk talking to a neuron and he says neurons do not fire they get fired and that's the essential essence of this McCulloch view that a neuron doesn't just fire it gets fired and it gets fired by some synaptic stimulus that means something and so that's why it's firing means something so here's a little uh, um, simulation, cartoon simulation of that. So this is synaptic conductances arriving on an imaginary neuron, and we think of them as individual events. Each one of them is caused by the firing of some other neuron. And they go along for, a, for quite a while, and they don't, each one of them makes a little synaptic potential in this, our postsynaptic neuron of interest, but none of them cause the cell to fire, and they are forgotten. So this one didn't, which came from this action potential didn't cause the cell to fire. And so it didn't matter at all. The cell has filtered it out. That's not the, the proposition the cell wishes to assert. But this little cluster of synaptic inputs are just right to cause the cell to fire. And so that is the, the uh, confluence of events that this neuron was designed to detect. And the neuron fires and asserts that that thing has happened. And the cellular parameters that control this are the membrane time constant, which determines how rapidly a synaptic event will be forgotten by the cell if it doesn't trigger a spike, the input impedance, which is the measure of the cell's sensitivity to input, uh, to synaptic inputs, and the voltage threshold, which I've shown here as a dotted line, which uh, causes the cell to fire. So this is the stuff that neurobiology classes are made of, and every student in every neurobiology class is taught that this is how neurons work. And this, the agenda of neuroscientists is to figure out what logical assertion is, proposition is asserted by every neuron in the brain, basically, track them all down and figure out how the circuits that make that happen. But if we're going to embark on that kind of a project, we should probably ask if there are ever any neurons that violate that? Are, are there any neurons that are exceptions to this rule? Maybe a neuron that doesn't get fired, a neuron that actually fires on its own. And yes, there are lots. And they a lot of them are the basal ganglia. So this is a di little diagram of the basal ganglia, and I don't want to go over the diagram 
very much. You probably all know this diagram really well. It's, uh, it's known by everybody. But I'm just uh, wanting to point out the different parts of the basal ganglia. So this is a coronal. Charlie, it, it actually might be um, useful for some of the people in the audience if you do kind of walk through it, not in not in okay. exhaustive detail, but just the kind of basic logic of direct yeah. indirect, I think would be really Happy helpful. Happy to do that. So this is a, a coronal section through the human brain at about this level. It's a four brain section, and of course only showing one side. And most of the, most of the brain at that level look, is cortex. So there's the cortex and the subcortical white matter occupies a lot of it. There's a, a piece right in the middle that is the thalamus. And uh, most of the rest of the, what you see is basal ganglia, well, with the exception of this thing. This is this tiny little thing down here is the hippocampus. So uh, these two pieces, the putamen and the caudate, make up the striatum together. And then the globus pallidus, uh, once called the lenticular nucleus because of its shape, and you can really see its lens-like shape here, is actually composed of two pieces, the external and internal segment. This is the substantia nigra that includes both the dopamine and non-dopamine components of substantia nigra and the subthalamic nucleus. And so together, these are the biggest forebrain components of the basal ganglia. There are also some pontine and mesencephalic components that you can't see in this picture. And the, the, if we just zoom in on this, I'll let the, the putamen stand for the striatum in general. The cortex provides a, and thalamus provide a huge innervation to the striatum. The striatum is a, is a, the, a source of a large number, maybe 80% of all the synapses in the globus pallidus, externa and interna, and in substantia nigra pars reticulata. The in, internal globus pallidus and substantia nigra pars reticulata are considered the output nuclei of the basal ganglia. Their axons go to the thalamus, to superior colliculus, lateral habinula, pedunculopontine nucleus, and these are the main targets of basal ganglia. Although there, uh, that's an oversimplification, and uh, but I, I'm not going to go into all the details of that, unless you have questions about the weird anatomical details about basal ganglia. The globus pallidus externa is in a kind of a funny position because it's an inside basal ganglia nucleus. Most of its inputs come from the basal ganglia, and most of its synapses that it, the, its neurons form are in the basal ganglia too. And it's um, uh, kind of unique in that regard, that it is the most uh, internal. And it is an internal hub for the basal ganglia. People these days are recognizing it more and more as a pivotal nucleus that, uh, that, that uh, con really controls the output, the way the output nuclei of the basal ganglia respond to the in, to their classic inputs from the striatum. So I hope that's a, enough uh, sort of brief uh, basal ganglia overview. I'm happy to answer yeah. questions. So I, I think the, the one thing I just maybe wanted to highlight, um, which I think is kind of fascinating, is that if you go and look in the sort of textbook description of the basal ganglia, the globus pallidus externus often gets sort of lumped into what we call the indirect pathway. And the idea there is that inputs from the cortex to the striatum then um, inhibit or, um, inhibit the globus pallidus externus. And, and then in that little pathway, the only output they have for the globus pallidus externus is down into the globus pallidus internus. Yes. And so, it, it, and in effect, this is sort of called the indirect pathway and, it, and it's often kind of associated with stopping or ceasing behavior. Um, but if you look at the globus pallidus externus, I, there was some, I saw an awesome talk at movement disorders when we were fortunate enough for it to be in Sydney uh, by um, Paul Bolam. And he, they showed that if you put uh, labeling into the globus pallidus externus cells, instead of just projecting down in a targeted fashion to the globus pallidus internus, they actually do this really interesting thing, which is sort of spread out everywhere. Um, and, and sometimes they come back up to the striatum and that gets, I think, called the archipallidal pathway. But, but the, the point that I want to make is not to dive into the details, but rather that the, the way that we are taught about it is not the whole story and that there's, there's much more complexity to the anatomy of this system than we kind of otherwise appreciate when we look at the kind of textbook story of kind of push-pull dynamics and direct-indirect pathway.
Sorry, sorry for interrupting, Charlie. I just wanted to kind of make sure that, that diagram that everybody looks at is from 1989. Yeah, I think it's worth it to think for a moment about what that means. That that diagram was really a little bit out of date when it was originally published, and it's completely, completely, totally dated now. I, I actually I have a whole seminar about like changing that diagram, but I, I didn't want to about updating it, but I didn't want to bother you with that. that of, that's probably something I'd be interested in, but uh, yeah, the others in the talk might not be. <laughs> so here's the cool thing about the globus pallidus neurons, but it's not just them. GPE, globus pallidus external, GPI, the internal one, which is the projects of the thalamus, substantia nigra, subthalamic nucleus, and also the dopamine cells of the substantia nigra pars compacta are total violators of this rule that neurons don't fire, that they get fired. In fact, all of these neurons fire on their own all the time, whether they have input or not. And in fact, if you dissociate them from the brain, take them out of the brain, they will fire in a dish. They fire in slices. They fire when their inputs are cut off. They are autonomously firing neuron. And their action potentials do not assert any logical proposition at all, except maybe that I'm still alive. That's all the neuron is saying when it fires an action potential. So if we are going to understand how the basal ganglia carries signals, we have to develop an idea about how autonomously firing neurons can carry signals. So that's what I want to talk about. First. So this is an actual recording of a globus pallidus neuron in a mouse, and uh, the neuron is firing. And you can see this is uh, this is slowed way down. This neuron is going at about 40 spikes per second, and you can see the spikes are coming in a fairly regular way, and but they're interrupted by these synaptic potentials. And so these are inhibitory synaptic potentials. We know where they're coming from. I'll show you more. They're actually coming from other globus pallidus neurons, but these synaptic potentials don't cause spikes, and they also don't prevent them, but they do sometimes delay them. So if you look at the interspike intervals that have one of these in them, they're a little bit longer on average than the ones that don't. And so this is a, a neuron that's um, not asserting a proposition with its action potentials, but somehow saying something by by the time between action potentials. And that was way slowed down. If you listen to it, this is cells are buzzing along. The, the basal ganglia is loaded with these. There's hundreds of thousands of neurons all firing very fast, all the time, on their own, day or night, when you're asleep, when you're awake, from before you're born until you die. And then and these, uh, it's, it's so much unlike what we normally think of as neurons firing rarely and each action potential meaning a lot. Well, the origin of this firing is the ion channels that are built into the cell. So here's an example of a cell like that firing and it fires an action potential. And immediately after the action potential, the membrane potential is brought to a hyperpolarized level by the spike after hyperpolarization, which is caused by this voltage-dependent potassium current. So when the cell depolarizes, it turns on the voltage-dependent potassium current that sucks the membrane down to, to a, a fairly hyperpolarized level. Calcium enters during the action potential, and that calcium triggers, that's the calcium-dependent potassium current, which is responsible for this slow after hyperpolarization. And then both of those decay away and they are spike triggered currents. But at the level of membrane potential that the cell is left at when those turn off, the, there's a sodium current that's already turning on at that level. So the minute those things turn off, the sodium current, which is shown here, inward current, the hyperpolarizing currents are always shown out, as up and are called outward and depolarizing ones are shown down and are called inward. This persistent sodium current is turning on at that level. It's not turning on very much because we're not very uh, depolarized, but as the cell becomes more and more depolarized, the sodium current turns on more and more. And so you can see the cell scoops up and fires another action potential. And then that whole thing repeats. And the cell is condemned to fire forever 
uh, on this kind of a schedule because it has these ion channels in it. Now, that doesn't mean that the cells don't signal things about the world. So here's an example from Steve Kitai's lab from a while ago of a recording from globus pallidus neurons in a rat while the rat is doing a, a nose poke task that it's been trained to do. I don't really know the details of the task, but there's some cue. And when the rat gets the cue, depending on what the cue is, it's supposed to poke its nose into the right or to the left. And then when it encounters the, its nose encounters the detector, that's indicated by this black line, then the, then the uh, rat will get a reward. So you can see that when Q onset, here's a cell that tended to fire. Each one of these is a trial. And you can see the cell was buzzing away, going pretty fast. The Q came on, it was a little pause. Then the cell had this sort of brush of firing not just one spike, but a, quite a long, this is, I think, about 250 milliseconds in each direction here. So the cell fired for a tenth of a second, and then uh, there's a sort of rarefied period of firing, and then goes back to normal again. And it responded differently when the animal is going to the right. So we, even though these cells are not really asserting a logical proposition. They are firing in relation to movement, and they mean something. We have to understand how they do that and what it means. So this is another piece of experimental data. This is from uh, uh, Hitoshi Kita, and uh, this is in a monkey and recording in the globus pallidus. And here's just a little tick mark. Every time the cell fired the action potential, this is one second. So this cell is buzzing along, but notice that unlike the example I showed you, it's not firing periodically. It fires fast and slow. It looks very irregular. And if you look at it, autocorrelation histogram, it looks like it's almost random, except for a, this is the refractory period. And then when the refractory period is over, the probability of firing again is pretty constant. And we think of that as an almost random pattern. I don't want to, random, it really should just say a very high entropy pattern. Now, this could be caused by anything. Synaptic inputs, for example, can cause this, especially if they were very high entropy synaptic inputs. But what Kita did was to inject just into the vicinity of this globus pallidus neuron, not in the whole globus pallidus, but just in the region containing the cells, so that most of the palatal neurons were unaffected by this but just injected a glutamate blocker. This is a blocker of AMPA channels, NBQX, into the vicinity of the cell. And the cell slows down, but it doesn't stop. So now the cell has no excitatory synaptic transmission anymore on it, but it's still firing, but slower. And now if we look at its firing pattern, we can see that there's some periodicity here. It's not firing at randomly anymore as randomly as it was, it was it's showing that in the absence of excitation, it starts to fire in a more periodic way. And then on top of that, if you inject a GABA A blocker, gabazine, which blocks almost all the inhibitory synaptic transmission, now we have a cell with basically no fast synaptic transmission on it at all. The cell speeds back up to about the same rate that it was at before any drugs were given, only now it is dead rhythmic, firing in a clock-like way. So basically, the rhythmicity of that cell that we see in slices or in dissociated cells is still there in vivo in the awake monkey, and it's being perturbed by synaptic inputs, which don't really change its rate very much, but change its pattern instead. So this leads us to view the globus pallidus neuron as a kind of clock. And so we can imagine the cells firing uh, as, uh, as just a timing mechanism. This cell has a, a period a, that it fires at rhythmically. So if we imagine this thing is a circle and spiking is here, and then the cell progresses around the circle and fires again. And so we can think of the cell state, not in terms of membrane potential, but in terms of phase. What proportion of its inner spike interval has it 
uh, already traversed at any one moment. And now if we give an input, and this is a real, this isn't a globus pallidus neuron, but it's a subthalamic nucleus neuron, so it's another periodically firing um, basal ganglia cell. If we stimulate, here we're stimulating the, uh, the cortical subthalamic pathway, which is an excitatory input to the cells. We stimulate it and we get a little EPSP in this purple trace that wasn't there in the, in the orange one. And we, you might expect that this EPSP would decay away according to the membrane time constant, but it doesn't. In fact, it just stays. So what's happening here is a charge that's being deposited on the membrane of the cell by that synaptic input is not leaking out through the ion channels that would normally allow it to leak out. And the reason is, of course, because the cell's own ion channels dominate. And so that charge gets incorporated into the oscillation as if that charge didn't come from the synapse, but came from the ion channels that make, make the oscillation happen in the first place. And so the net result is the cell continues on its progression toward firing, but at, uh, as if an extra piece of time had elapsed. It just moves forward in time by this amount, which I've marked as the delta ISI. So the main effect of this synapse was to shift the cell in time actually in phase, we should think of it as phase, which is time normalized by the inner spike interval. And so uh, another feature I would point out about this is that, um, that no synaptic input gets forgotten in a neuron like this. So no matter when it happens, the charge that's delivered doesn't leak out through the input impedance yeah, with any particular time constant. Instead, it always gets incorporated and every input uh, contributes to the timing of the next spike. And if I look, uh, if we to try this experiment at various times, so we could give our stimulus at various times with respect to the inner spike interval, and then just measure how much of a change in the ISI we get, we get this characteristic curve that tells us about sensitivity of the cell to input at various times during its phase. And this is called the phase resetting curve. And this takes the place of all the usual measures that you would make of a neuron to try to figure out how it integrates synaptic transmission. So for example, we don't have a time constant to worry about, no input impedance, no voltage threshold, Obviously, voltage threshold doesn't mean anything here because the cell is going to fire again. In some sense, it's always above threshold. It's always for sure going to fire. So instead, this thing becomes a complete description of the sensitivity of the neuron to synaptic input. And if we can scale it, this is for a particular synaptic input, this particular curve. But, um, but if we scale it by the size of the synaptic input, it could become a complete description of the response of the cell. So here's an experiment like that. In this case, we're giving just a little packet of charge through the intracellular recording electrode at various times after an action potential. We can give a positive packet of charge and move the spike earlier, give a negative one and move it later. We can make bigger and smaller ones and we can measure this effect. And so if we, uh, plot how big of a change in the inner spike interval we got versus the size of the current we got for both depolarizing and hyperpolarizing currents, we find that we get a linear relationship between this. And this is the, this is the sensitivity of the cell at that moment. And you can see it's symmetric for, for inhibitory and excitatory inputs, so we don't really have to think of them as qualitatively different. They are just on a continuum of negative or positive charges being a, uh, applied to the cell. And, we, and so the slope of this line is that sensitivity and we collect that at all different phases. We could make a new curve, which is the called the infinitesimal phase resetting curve, which means that it is scaled by the amplitude of the stimulus. This is for one for a different cell, it's not the same cell, but this is actually for a globus pallidus cell. 
and you see that those cells start out not very sensitive and they become more and more sensitive to input as time goes on. And then just before they fire, the cell becomes very insensitive. So if we're armed with this, we can predict the effect of any input on the cell using this simple differential equation. So this, in this equation, uh, phi is the phase of the cell, relative time since the next spike uh, scaled by the inner spike interval. This is the cell's rate in the absence of any input. So this is its average unperturbed rate. This Z is this curve. It's the infinitesimal phase or setting curve. And then this is any time varying stimulus that you care to give. And so this gives us something we've never had when making models of neurons, which is a phenomenologically accurate, qualitatively predictive, uh, a simple equation for when the cell is going to fire for any arbitrary input that we care to give. And I'm not going to show you a lot of it, but in my lab, we spent a lot of time giving arbitrary inputs to cells, trying to predict the response in the using the phase resetting curve and doing it with uh, incredible accuracy. It's something we've never been able to do with model neurons because when you make a, a physical model of a neuron, you have to know the ion channels that are located at every different place on the neuron, and uh, we never know that. So this is a makes this kind of neuron particularly easy for us to predict. Can I ask Charlie? Um, sure. Are the those Z curves that you're showing there for that neuron on the bottom left? How how much do they? How much does the gradient of those or the character of them change across the different nuclei of the basal ganglia or the different autonomous nuclei that we think about in the brain? Yeah, so we have we have been answering that question just by collecting them in a bunch of different places. Yeah. So uh, spiny neurons have their own, that's for sure, but, but yeah. direct and indirect pathway neurons are the same. Uh, cholinergic inner neurons have a particularly interesting and unusual one, the dopamine cells have a yet another one. This is from a subthalamic nucleus neuron up here. The globus pallidus and the substantia nigra and globus pallidus internal ones look fairly similar. Okay. And there's two kinds of globus pallidus cells. Uh, I'm going to say something about that in a minute, but uh, right now we're in, the, we're in the business of trying to compare those two to see if they're really different from each other from the phase resetting point of view. Okay, and then just one follow -up, quick follow-up. So if we were to think about other autonomously uh, active neurons, uh, you know, the ascending arousal system is something that, you know, typically comes to mind. So things like the locus cerullus and basal nucleus of Maynard and things like that. Do they have qualitatively similar kinds of things to the, say, the dopaminergic neurons that you've looked at? Or has anyone looked at this? Is this the kind of- I don't think anybody has looked done? at locus cerullus or, or I, I have, I have a little bit of data on basal nucleus of minor because I every now and then I accidentally get one of those in the yeah, course right. <laughs> of globus pallidus, um, but I don't, I've never seen anything published about them. Okay, cool. And then just really quickly, um, Tom Close has asked, do you always see such strong linear and symmetric relationships? That's a good question. And um, this experiment really asking the linearity of it is, reproduce every time we measure a phase resetting curve. And uh, the answer is that they are linear over a range of input uh, intensities. And if you give a really large input in either direction, you can drive the cell off of this linear relationship. And when you do that, the phase resetting curve is no longer really a valid predictor of what the cell is going to do. And so the phase resetting curve isn't a complete description of the neuron. It is an approximation, and it, and it predicts the neuron over some range of inputs, strengths, and patterns. Um, there's a lot of theoretical work about that, and there's some, uh, unfortunately, the theoretical work is not a very good guide to what real neurons do. Uh, but for, to my delight, the real neurons are more robustly described by phase resetting curves than, the, than most theoreticians have told us they were going to be.
but it's an empirical thing. It just has to be worked out neuron by neuron. And uh, there are not very many people measuring phase resetting curves of basal ganglia or any other neurons. So, um, but we're working on it as fast as we can and trying to find the limits of usefulness of this approach, which is admittedly an approximation, um, not, a, not the kind of pure complete theory of neuron that you might yearn for. Is that okay? Yeah, that was great. Uh, Tom, uh, if, if there's a follow-up, maybe we can ask at the end and we'll just keep uh, trucking okay. on. So here's a little uh, example of trying to predict the spikes. Here's a, uh, this is a subthalamic nucleus neuron and it's firing along at its rate. And then what we do is we just bombard it with this barrage of noise. And this is a series of one half millisecond current pulses each one is drawn independently from a Gaussian distribution. And so this is a, a kind of Gaussian shot noise, but it has half millisecond duration. And the reason for that is because our amplifiers have a limited bandwidth and we don't want to throw away any of that current uh, in amplifier electrode capacitance. So those are the shortest pulses we can reliably deliver a known amount of charge to the cell membrane. But otherwise, we think of it as a sort of um, Gaussian noise. And if you look at what that does to the neuron, you can see that it's perturbing the firing really a lot. And if you compare the, the, inter, the autocorrelation of spiking of, it, of intervals for the unperturbed case, you can see that it's very periodic and very regular. And with this amount of of noise, which is not all that much. I think that it's a 40 picoamp um, standard deviation. And um, I should say that uh, a cortical synaptic input, single cortical synaptic inputs amplitude is about 12 picoamps. So this would be on the order of just a countable, on your hand, countable number of, of inputs of synapses can disrupt the firing very much and make it look like that thing that we said looked like random pattern. So is it really random or does it reflect our the fine structure of the noise that we give it? So we can use this noise, pass it through our equation and predict that each action potential that ought to happen. And so here's a, here is a firing pattern of a subthalamic nucleus neuron under the influences of our noise that we've created, and then we can predict when spikes ought to happen, and the predictions are these red lines. And you can see that our prediction is good. It's not perfect, but uh, because there's other inputs to the neuron that we don't control, and the neuron has a little noise of its own. But you can see that we can predict, this is our predicted ISI, these are the observed ISIs. And so this is the closest thing to really to a predictive model of neuronal activity or arbitrary input that I think has ever been done for a real neuron. So now let's, uh, I, did, I told you I don't want to talk about single neurons, but I just have been talking about single neurons for this whole time. I, but, um, but because we have this ability to predict what a single neuron would do, we now have the potential for describing the network because we can actually make a predictive model of a bunch of neurons connected like the real network and see what it would do. So here's our network. This is the globus pallidus, and this was the thing that uh, Mac was just talking about. There are two kinds of globus pallidus neurons, which here are called PV, which stands for parvalbumin, and NPAS1, which is just another molecular marker. And the PV neurons are the ones you've heard of, probably that, that go to the output nuclei of the basal ganglia. The NPAS1 neurons have been relatively recently discovered, and they project to the striatum and to the cortex and to the nucleus reticularis in the thalamus and also to dopamine neurons in the midbrain. And, uh, and all of these neurons make synapses on other neurons of the same type and on different types. And then the PV neurons preferentially are contacted by the indirect pathway and the in-pass neurons are preferentially contacted by the direct pathway, although there's, it's not perfect, it's just preferential. So this is the network we would like to understand. The PV neurons have a special relationship with the excitatory input from the subthalamic nucleus. The in-pass neurons have a special relationship with the excitatory inputs from the cortex, which are not shown here. 
So this is the network. And the key to this network is to understand the lateral inhibitory connections among the neurons. So we know what each neuron's going to do with its input. But what happens to the network is basically determined by the implications of the fact that they're connected together by inhibitory synapses. So how will it neurons that are connect that are firing all the time and constantly inhibiting each other at at rates up to 100 spikes per second how are they going to respond to each other so uh, this is a little drawing from the Paul Bolam lab showing a gp neuron and the black lines are the dendrites the red line is the axon and green dots are the protons formed by this neuron onto other gp neurons and you see they they make a lot of synapses on neurons near them and then a little group of synapses on neurons that are not near them. So what we're trying to build this network basically. And so what I'm gonna show you are some toy simulations that are scaled down versions of a bigger simulation of the GP that we're currently making. So first we need to know what the connections between them are like. So recently we did this by looking at synaptic currents in single GP neurons. So what you do here is get a patch recording of a GP neuron in the slice. The neuron is connected to other GP neurons in the slice because we've cut it in the plane that keeps those connections intact. So in fact, we've tried to cut in exactly this plane here that would maximize the connections so that we can see the connections that are shown here, but we won't be seeing these. And, uh, and so the cells are firing along in the slice, and this is a cell firing very rapidly. And then we can actually stop the cells from firing. These are the PV cells, because we've loaded them with archibrodopsin, which will inhibit the cells when the green light is turned on. And you turn on the light, and you can really see, you can just step on firing and make them all stop. So we're making all the PV neurons in the vicinity of this neuron in the slice, probably all of them in the whole slice, stop firing for like 10 seconds. And then we can look at the synaptic currents that are being evoked in another PV cell or in an impasse neuron. And uh, there's some nerdy details about this, uh, but um, so normally th these are outward currents, so they should be drawn up, but they but we've reversed the chloride <laughs> concentration gradient so that they will be inward and so we can record them more easily and they look larger than they really are. And that's good for us because we're trying to record small things. But here you can see that, uh, that before we turn on the light, this neuron is being bombarded with synaptic inputs from other PV neurons. And when we turn off the light, those go completely away. And we turn, look, tur turn, turn the light on, they go away. We turn the light off and they come back. And if you look at them, you can see that they are periodic, just like the firing of GP neurons. So each GP neuron, you might think that they're buzzing away so fast that their synapses couldn't possibly keep up with that, but the synapses keep up with it just fine. And every time one of these other neurons fires, it makes a big synaptic current in the postsynaptic and all the other neurons that it's connected to. And those stop when we turn on the light. And when we turn it off, you can see that the cells sped up because the cells were inhibited for a while and they get uh, they have a kind of rebound of faster firing. And also these get a little bit larger because there was some uh, frequency dependent depression of this synaptic transmission. It wasn't really a lot, but maybe they get 50% larger. So this connection among the cells is big and it is strong and it's reliable. Every time a presynaptic cell fires, pretty much we get a postsynaptic response. And so that tells us from this, we could extract a lot of information, the reliability, the amplitude, the rise time, the time constant of decay, and the number of synaptic connections that each cell is getting in the slice. And we have a way of correcting that for the number that we would get if the tissue had not been sliced. So we know a lot about how to connect up the network. And if we give this, if we excite the- Can I jump in real quick? Sorry, Charlie, we, we had a question yeah. that it goes back just one slide about the connections from the end pass neurons to the cortex. Um, are they, uh, so Luis had asked about those, are they similar to the ones that um, Sabatini and Lou's group showed 
with the GPE projecting back to like interneurons and pyramidal cells and things, or how should we be thinking about that? I think that they were looking at a glutamate pathway. Okay. Uh, but this is GABAergic. I'm, I'm not completely sure. I'm not completely okay. sure about that. But there were studies of palatocortical pathways over the years, and yeah. they have been. Uh, it's been kind of controversial. And it wasn't really until about the time that he did that paper, which is about the time that we started having good markers for these various kinds of GP neurons that the, you know, the, our knowledge of the in neurons blossomed. Got it. In fact, Got it. the in neurons are in probably three different categories. One that goes primarily to the stridum. It used to be called the archipelagal pathway. And it used to be only like five years ago, but now it's, that's already a little bit obsolete because there's another impasse neuron type that goes to the thalamus, to the particular nucleus, and a third one that goes to the cortex. And there may be some collateralization among them. Um, uh, that kind of stuff is still being worked out. It's an area of, of real uh, exciting developments right now, studying the cell types of the globus pallidus. Lots yeah, of cool. People. Thanks very much, Charlie. Yeah. So here we stimulate the indirect pathway and we're, we're recording the synaptic input to a GP neuron. So of course, when we stimulate the indirect pathway right here, we get a huge synaptic inhibition as expected, but these are the inputs from other GP neurons that are pop popping along on their own. And when we inhibit, we inhibit all of the parvalbumin cells with this indirect pathway activation, and we get a big pause in the spontaneous IPSCs. And when they come back, they come back in a rhythmic way, and the rhythmic rhythm kind of breaks up because different cells are going at different rates, and so they're all kind of synchronized. Presynaptic cells all get synchronized by this inhibition, and the inhibition comes back. So this is the, the beginning of thinking about the network. So now we're not just looking at the activity of one neuron, but I'm sitting in one neuron looking at the activity of all the neurons that come to it, all of the GP neurons that, that project to the GP neuron I'm watching. So this is the closest thing for me to see the network. And it isn't the whole network, it is the ensemble of neurons that's controlling the neuron I'm looking at. And I'm super interested in that ensemble. I think of that as a functional unit of meaning, not the single neuron, but the bunch of, bunch of neurons that all project to the same target. And so I'm seeing what happens and I can see what that network is gonna do at various times after a, 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 a input from striatum. And so that's the kind of thing I, that I want to understand and be able to predict. Okay, so now I'm just going to show a series of little uh, simulations because I've really burned through all of my time. And, um, uh, and so this is uh, just taking 100 identical periodic neurons, each firing at 30 spikes per second. They're all inhibiting each other. This is their phase resetting curve. And they're going to fire whenever they pass 12 o'clock. And then they're going to rotate on around at 30 per second and fire again. And each of them is a different color just so that we can see them apart and see whether they're getting mixed or not, that kind of thing. And I've slowed it way down. And so now I'm gonna just turn it on and you can see what's gonna happen. So whenever a cell fires, it inhibits all of its neighbors. But what cells are the most sensitive? The most sensitive cells are the ones who are at late phases because that's this point. And so the cells that get inhibited when a cell fires are the ones here. And so a bunch of them go through and that inhibition builds up and pushes the ones behind that are falling behind. And so what a network like this will do is to break into the, up into synchronous clusters that all fire together. And that, uh, and the number of these synchronous clusters is determined by the shape of the phase resetting curve and the strength of the inhibition. And of course this is going really slow compared to the real speed of the neurons. So isn't that, interesting except and you can see that how synchronized they're all becoming and it's turning into just six uh, synchronous subunits out of the hundred neurons and charlie course, do they naturally just sort of fall into a steady state based on the kind of refractory period and the time scale of the different channels you showed yes, before this, 
this model will do that. It'll turn into a steady state. Uh, limit, limit cycle, thinking, yeah. Uh, it, uh, with a basically this 30 spikes per second uh, period. And yeah, that's, then, that's really fascinating. Can I throw another question in, Charlie? Sure. Um, if you start, you started with uh, all the oscillators basically evenly distributed around the phases. Yeah. What happens if you, I don't know, cluster them more or, or fully randomize them? Uh, do you still come to this same sort of system attractor? You can get more or fewer clusters uh -huh. if, you, if you kind of rig the initial conditions. Right. You can. But I want to argue that this, as cool and interesting as this mm. result is, it's not a, it is not a model that we should dilly dally with and think about. Uh, we have a hundred identical neurons. Our neurons all fire at different rates. There's an enormous range of different firing rates of GP neurons, and they are not all identical in terms of their other features, and they're not all connected to each other. And so. <laughs> As I, I think this is great, although GP neurons don't do this. We already know from lots of experimental studies that that synchronization of GP neurons is, just doesn't happen in the resting state. So, uh, so let's uh, let's ask a, about a little bit more realistic model. So in this case, I'm adding just jitter. So neurons may be fired periodically, but they don't fire exactly periodically, and they have some jitter. This is a real neuron, and I've just superimposed a bunch of interspike intervals, and you can see the kind of jitter that happens when we have poisoned all synaptic transmissions. So this is intrinsic jitter that's just because the ion channels in the cells are stochastic elements themselves. So if I add this amount of jitter into that same model, now that clustering goes away and we do not reach a steady state clustered synchrony solution. So it didn't take much jitter. This is, uh, this is the intrinsic jitter. It's not very much compared to what real neurons have and it completely obliterates that synchronized clustered solution, which is a solution that theorists have been very interested in for periodic neurons for a long time. But one thing you do see is that cells are still accumulating at late phases. So this is the vector, population vector for all 100 neurons. And you can see that it's pointing over here. The center of gravity of the, of the distribution of phases is way over here at late phase. And this is in the place where the, where the phase resetting curve is the highest is the strongest, and that's exactly what you expect because every time a cell fires, it's going to inhibit the others, all of the others, but the ones that are going to be affected most are the ones who are at the peak of their phase resetting curve. And so they're going to be inhibited the most. These will be inhibited less, and so they're going to come on around and join these, and there's going to be a tendency for them to cluster up at late phase. So now I'm going to add some uh, rate heterogeneity. So this is a little sample of GP cells from a while ago. We have a lot bigger sample now, but it isn't bad. And it shows that there's a wide range of GP cell firing rates. This is just for PV cells. If you include the in-pass cells, you get even more rate heterogeneity. And you can see a lot of them are firing around 20 hertz, some of them as fast as 80. And, uh, and so now I'm just going to give this, um, this distribution or a smooth version of this distribution to the rates of these neurons. So some are going to be going faster than others. I think the red ones go the fastest. And uh, we can watch some of them move ahead of the others. And, uh, and again, we get this buildup of late phases and the uh, 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 but cells don't stay in their correct relationship to each other. You can see the fastest cells are going to lap the slowest cells. And uh, this thing uh, is going to inhibit, inhibit clustering a little bit. This is without the jitter. And so this is exactly the same model that clustered, that gave us synchronous clusters before. But now with rate heterogeneity, it won't cluster because if two cells are happen to be in the same cluster, they're going to 
spread each other out, spread apart from each other over time because they're going at different rates around the circle. So they won't stick together when they're not firing and when they're not being pushed by other neurons. But despite the rate heterogeneity, we still get this very heavy buildup of neurons at late rate. Now, if we look for spike to spike correlations here, we wouldn't see anything. There's no spike to spike correlations um, across these neurons. Uh, what to speak of, what's correlated is its phase, which is something you can never see in a real neuron. You don't know phase. It's sometimes called latent phase because you don't know the phase of a neuron until it fires and you say, oh, well, its phase is one, it just fired. And then you have to infer a phase from then all the way around to one again. In this model, of course, we can see the phases and we can see that cells have become highly correlated in phase without becoming very correlated in firing. This is important in GP because there have been lots of studies showing that GP cells are not correlated in firing and very hard to understand why not. So now I'm going to add that I'm going to have both noise and rate heterogeneity, and I'm going to cut the coupling down because before I had all to all coupling, but we have been measuring the coupling of real GP neurons, and we know that their coupling is a lot sparser than that. So this is the same thing but with sparse coupling added. And you can see that every time we add one of these you know, realistic heterogeneities, it deorganizes the network and makes it less predictable. And it's definitely, I'm not showing you the spike to cell to cell spike correlations of which there would be many because there's a hundred cells, but the spike to spike correlations are completely falling apart as we add these realistic features to the network as if the network is combating uh, spike to spike correlations, resting correlations, but they, uh, and of course, spike to spike resting correlations would decrease the, the information carrying capacity of the network because the more correlated cells are, the less independent they are. And so the less information they carry independently. And so it is usually said that the lack of correlation in GP is an indication of the, of the sort of high entropy of the network and its ability to carry lots of information. But despite that happening, we're still getting this real big buildup of at late phases. And so I'm, you know, I'm tempted just to say the purpose of cell to cell connectivity in the network is to create this phase distribution. And then if I say that, you're thinking, but what good is that? The phase distribution doesn't get reflected in firing. And it's true that in the resting network, that is the network, this network's not being perturbed from the outside. This, as far as we can tell, the connectivity between neurons is not having a big effect on their firing pattern. It's having an effect on their phase. And so it doesn't get seen in the resting pattern in the absence of external input. So now let us try just giving the exact same network I just did, but now we're going to give a synaptic input, which will be a, like a, just a very brief excitation that I think happens at about 200 milliseconds. So now here goes the network. I'm going, and here you can see the, the buildup at late phases, and you can see that in the population vector. And now when the input comes, the input, that was that flash, that was the input. Let's go back and revisit it. So right at the moment that the excitatory input came, there were a lot of cells sitting right here at late phases. Now, excitatory input is going to move cells forward in time. That is, there it's going to rotate them clockwise around the inhibition was rotating cells counterclockwise. Excitation is going to rotate them clockwise. And the cells that are going to be most sensitive to excitation are the ones that are at late phases because that's where the PRC is the highest. And so that means this synaptic input is going, to, is going to reap a certain portion of the population of neurons and push them to fire. And that population is going to be the late phase population, which is a big group because of the local inhibition. So now we can watch that in moments right after that input, we can see this group 
was shoved across, they're also shoved closer to each other in phase. And because they fired, they kicked these other guys back. And so now they become a little uh, bolus of cells at the same phase, which will then rotate on around. And so the presence of that local inhibition didn't have a big effect on firing pattern. It didn't have a big effect on firing rate. But what it did was have a huge effect on increasing the sensitivity of the network to this excitatory input. It has a very similar effect on inhibitory inputs. And, the, and the, these are just toy, these are little hundred cell toys, but we're working in the lab on a, on a much larger version of the network, uh, which shows all of these same phenomena. Uh, it may be more slightly more complicated with some additional features. And uh, I'm hoping that we will be able to show in a more realistically large network uh, a lot more about what GP cells actually can do when, as a network together. And I'd like to be able to explain cellular properties in terms of what the network is supposed to be doing. So here's our group. Uh, Matt Higgs and I did that that GP to GP cell uh, synaptic uh, response stuff. This is, Matt is now at Oklahoma Medical Research Institute. This is Denard Simmons. And Denard, I didn't show you Denard's work, but he did uh, a lot of work on the effect of GP on the output neurons of the striatum of, of the basal ganglia and substantia nigra neurons. And he did that work using the same kind of methods and then um, and made a, a, a sort of phenomenological model of the effect of GP on substantia nigra. Sharman Levy, who does all of our great anatomy and also is uh, our chief mouse rancher and, and does all the virus injections and stuff to get our channel rhodopsin and arc rhodopsin in place. This is Eric Oliveris, who is working on the model. He is like an all day a computer modeling guy. Juan Morales, who's been working on striatum. I didn't talk to you about striatum, but I'd love to sometime. And uh, James Jones, who is uh, also working on globus pallidus and uh, is a new student uh, working on the current clamp recordings in globus pallidus. So that's it. I, uh, I sort of almost got done an hour after I'd promised 30 to 45 minutes. But no, that was absolutely fantastic, Charlie. Thank you so much. Um, so um, I think we've, you know, uh, got a bit of time for some questions if people are interested. Um, if you'd like to ask a question, feel free to, you know, we've got a relatively small group, so feel free to, um, you know, unmask your video and unmute yourself. Um, if you prefer to write in the chat, um, please feel free to do that. Um, so I, I might in take that. Tom Close asked about Purkinje cells, and yes. Purkinje cells is one of the rare cells in the brain that whose phaser setting curve has been studied okay and uh, uh, and it's very interesting it's not something i'm working on but they are i guess so we should be able to dig that out yeah okay awesome i'll uh, I'll, I'll look into that um I, I wanted to ask you a question though i'll take the um the privilege um i'm curious to know whether or not there's been an expl uh, exploration of neuromodulatory receptors on the PV and um, what was the other class, the NPAS. I wonder whether or not different dopaminergic receptors are expressed on them or different cholinergic receptors. Um, where, you know, whether we know much about whether or not you could control the expression of their activity or maybe even kind of augment their phase relationships or something like that with different neurochemicals. Well, we know the one of the most important things about the, in the phase model is the cell's unperturbed firing rate, omega, and the and also the heterogeneity of it. I sort of showed you there yeah. that heterogeneity is super important and amazing how much heterogeneity there is. We were at first really shocked by the by the wide range of firing rates which we shouldn't have been because people who've done extracellular recording for decades have been reporting this kind of under their breath. Mm -hmm. They tell you what the mean rate was and then they tell you what the standard deviation was. And, it, and you, if you looked at the standard deviation, you'd say, oh my God, you know, there, it's enormous. It's all over the place. Yeah. 
And that isn't an error of measurement, that's real. Uh, well, and it looks strikingly non-Gaussian too, right? It had this real strict exponential kind of feel to it. Yeah, fat it's tail. got a big long tail. It's, there's yeah. some, there's a few cells that are going really fast, and a smaller number that are uh, going really slow. Mm. And that, uh, and this is one of the things that we want to come out of the model because we, we think that actually that distribution of rates is determined by the, uh, by the local interconnections in GP. Yeah. yeah. But. Uh, at least some some aspect of it, but that heterogeneity is definitely under modular modularity mo, neuromodular uh, neuromodulator control. control. Yeah. yeah, and and we have studied it a little bit. So what we saw was that the the reason this is I don't know maybe this doesn't appeal to you, but to me this seems like a really a beautiful fact. The reason that there's such a large heterogeneity is because all of the cells are changing. They're wandering in rate. They're speeding up and slowing down over time, over tens of minutes, even hours. And so at any one moment, you see some fast cells and some slow cells. But if you watch the fast cells for a while, they'll become slow ones. If you watch the slow ones for a while, they'll become fast ones. And the fact that they're wandering independently of each other is guaranteeing this rate heterogeneity. Mm. And and the thing that's changing as they wander around is this H is HCN. It's a cyclic yeah. nucleotide controlled non-specific. It's, it's actually sitting on those little um, stalks of those yeah, pyramidal right. cells as well. Yeah, famously yeah, yeah. on pyramidal cells. Yeah. So uh, so the so the heterogeneity is definitely under modulatory control. Another thing I that I know about for sure is that the release of GABA from the GABA terminals is that, uh, you know, the probability of release and reliability of transmission is under control of opiates. And that those are not my work, but, but that's been known for 10 years or so that um, even though we didn't have a really strong idea about what the importance of that GABA synapses were. We knew that they, their release was modulated by opiates. And so but that's just the beginning, I think, of yeah. that stuff. There's going to be a lot. Great. Um, that's excellent. Um, do we have any questions? I, I have one that's perhaps um, slightly um, uh, sort of uh, uncharacteristic. I might ask a question of Joe rather than you, Charlie. I'm curious to know, so Joe, um, as I mentioned before, has a background in information theory and thinks a lot about um, how signals can influence one another around a network. So you can measure the uncertainty reduction that you'd receive by knowing, by having knowledge of a previous region's time series or another region you can ask for its influence with say transfer entropy. And I'm really curious to know, Joe, whether the kind of language that you've that you've kind of seen from Charlie today about autonomously active cells that get popped around and their phase gets changed rather than the traditional kind of message passing analogy of causality, whether that's something that we could make contact with with information theory or whether there's like ready made, um, you know, uh, techniques for trying to kind of perturb or, the, the, or try to answer those questions, I guess. Mm. Yeah, that, that's a that's a great question. Um... You know, I, I don't have a, a very clear answer <laughs> straight up, um, but certainly, you know, the absence of a, of a signal can be just as informative as the presence of one or, or, or mm. a, presence or absence of a spike can be just as informative. You know, we can construct really simple examples of, um, you know, an example I like to use in my lectures is, is a heartbeat message from a server telling you that it's up, you know, it's up, it's up it's up and after a while that's not very informative and suddenly it's down and the signal's missing and that's super informative. Uh, so, you know, the absence of a spike can be just as informative. What, what's a little bit difficult is, uh, is like Charlie mentioned, um, um, you know, what, what's really happening here is the latent phase and that's, that's kind of hidden from you. Um, you can do a lot of embeddings uh, of, you know, the past neurons uh, to try and establish uh what the underlying uh, latent variable might be. But uh, in this example, it's going to be difficult to, to directly get at that because it's not just uh, the past values of, of that one uh, spike train that you're looking at that are going to tell you that because you've got other inhibitory ones coming in that are affecting it and uh, 
you've got to start to look at those as well. Um, so that, that's, I think, one of the, the big challenges there. Um, certainly, the, there's, there's things that I think we can do uh, to start looking at information flows around, uh, around these sorts of networks, um, uh, which obviously I was thinking about while, while the talk was going on. Uh, but I don't really have a, a, good, uh, a good experiment in mind right now of what we could measure that, that would add to, to what's going on here. Um, mm. Right. But it's certainly so one, something I want to think more about. Um, while, while I'm on screen, let me just say, Charlie, oh, yeah, I, love, I love the way you're stepping through the model there, turning certain features on and off and uh, gradually getting to that point of showing what happens when the excitatory uh, stimulus comes in. I don't know what that was. <laughs> I'll work it out later. Very informative. <laughs> so, that's a surprise. Uh, do <laughs> we have... Oh, sorry. Any, do you want to make a comment, Charlie, or do we have any questions from anyone else? One of the things that I would say about, we think a little bit about information, maybe not quite in the same context that you guys do, but uh, we, we think we're thinking about the neuron as a, kind of an analog communication element. So if you give a, a waveform to the input of, an, of a group of neurons, and the group of neurons that we're interested in are the ones that all project to the same basal ganglia output neuron. So that actually turns out to be a small number. So if we find one neuron in basal ganglia output neuron in substantia nigra, it turns out there's about 10 GP cells that project to that neuron. Hmm. And so those 10 cells are constantly bombarding that basal ganglia output neuron. Now, if, they're, if their activity is all independent of each other, then that just kind of looks like noise to that basal ganglia output neuron. It, can sh it will change its average phase, just like it does in GP, and will, make, and will control the excitability of the neuron to an external input, but it won't actually structure the firing of that neuron. And so no message in the usual sense is being passed. But if, the, if the, the, those groups, the, that cell, set of cells has a common input, even if it's kind of weak, even if it's only a tiny fraction of their total input current waveform, but it's common among all of them, then that structure will appear, the structure of that will appear on the synaptic conductance in substantia nigra. Mm -hmm. And so we're thinking of, uh, this is the kind of thing we can do. We can impose a sine wave, for example, on the group of cells in GP. And then we can look at the synaptic conductance being delivered in substantia nigra. And we can put our, our sine wave on all the GP cells. It doesn't matter because it's only 10 of them that are going to that one substantia nigra cell anyway. And if we spill out of that 10, it doesn't affect our, that substantia nigra cell. And so we can ask how, how strong of a signal is that? How much of an effect can it have on substantia nigra cell firing? And what's the frequency bandwidth of that? Is it going to work at high frequencies, is there some kind of cutoff that won't go above? Um, how faithful is it? Is there some like nonlinear mm -hmm. harmonics that appear in it? And um, and so that we're we're viewing it the communication problem sort of that way. It, it's a it's a kind of old fashioned analog way. And I think about. I know when I was a teenager, I was a ham radio operator, and I like trying to remember all of my radio fundamentals while we're doing this. <laughs> um, I had a question, Charlie, about your model. Um, it reminded me a lot of uh, the Kuramoto model with, I guess, a set of stimulus that you were able to inject. And I, I you know, one of the key features of the Kuramoto model is that you can get fundamentally different behavior if the coupling between all of the units is low or passes that critical threshold is high. And I wondered if you'd, I think you had all to all connectivity, but have you messed around with that kind of coupling strength to work out whether or not there's some, you know, some interesting phenomena that you could recreate 
super versus subcritical in the model, or is that something okay. that you? Yeah, the the, uh, the outcome of this coupled inhibitorily coupled oscillator problem it really strictly depends on the duration and strength of the synaptic inputs. It's terribly important. I mean, the, the thing can be synchronizing or desynchronizing, mm. just adjusting those things. So that's, and playing around with models, sort of the first thing you notice is, oh my gosh, I can get anything out of this. So that was why it was so important for us to measure those synaptic conductances mm their amplitude, reliability, their onset time constants, their decay time constants, without and the number, uh, the convergence ratio. Because without that, you can make a model, uh, you can make a family of models that have just mm. about any outcome you want. Yeah, I, uh, I, I fundamentally this. agree that the constraints are probably the most important part of a model for, for any students listening uh, I've, I've only been involved in a few projects that have used models, but in each case, everyone that I've worked with that has more experience than me gives me exactly the same bit of advice, which is that you really, really need to make sure that your constraints are in place before you go playing around, because otherwise you can find all manners of fun things, but you don't really know how much you can infer from them after you've gotten to the end and found the interesting results. So yeah, so I didn't mean to interrupt. I just think it's a really cool point. I would add that it is worthwhile to just play around with them even when you don't know the constraints, just to illuminate yourself about the space in which your model can move. And also once we, we've measured our constraints, like you sort of were implying earlier, once you've measured your constraints, you've measured them for this particular situation. But some of the things you're measuring may very well be under dynamic control. And your and so your network, you say, oh, the network lives in this regime and it does this thing. But it could well be that a little shift in some neuromodulator and the network will change gears and do the other thing. And if you don't know that other thing is a thing this network can do because you haven't played around with the parameters, then that will catch you completely by surprise when you do yeah. discover. Yeah, I totally agree. Like Eve Marta's works a really lovely example of that. There are vast, like they take the lobster stomatus gastric ganglion, which is only a few different cells. Some have gap junctions, some inhibit others, whatever. And their, their primary function is to create this kind of rhythmic peristalsis movement of the, of the gut. And I, I love that she, that if she changes the temperature of that uh, little group of cells, the, the whole thing will basically give exactly the same phenomena until it doesn't. Uh, and so it really is evidence of this kind of critical kind of uh, phenomena where you have like this amazing robustness to changes in parameters, but then an amazing sensitivity in completely different regions. And I agree, it's such a fascinating kind of um, feature of biological circuitry that um, is quite, I, I don't know, if you haven't seen it before, it's kind of unintuitive, but then as soon as you notice it, you start seeing it everywhere you look. Um, it's quite a pervasive, Signature. Um, okay, so um, if we don't have any more specific questions, um, uh, we'll do that really awkward thing where on Zoom you can't hear anyone clapping like you normally would in a lecture theater, but that was absolutely fantastic, Charlie. That, that was everything I was hoping for and more. Um, I think, you know, if you compare and contrast that to the, the talk we heard from, we had Olaf Spawns on a couple of weeks ago, Charlie is a big network neuroscience guy who thinks about this kind of big picture. Here, Charlie's taking us right down into the details of individual circuits and cells, cellular populations interacting together. And it's absolutely fascinating to me that our job as neuroscientists, in a way, as a sort of whole field, is to somehow join the dots between those different perspectives and think about how someone looking at the system from a uh, uh, you know, bird's eye view might be looking, might be describing the same system as someone describing it down uh, in, in detail in the level of the circuit. So that was really, really great. Um, absolutely fantastic. So thank you very much. Um, I'll stop the recording there. Great.